All right, here's today's CME. So again, reminder, uh, the department's research symposium, September 21 at the Great Hall of the Trent Seaman Center. Uh, I assume it's around five o'clock, 5.30 to eight. And anyone who wants a poster to hang up a poster, just get hold of Will. Another reminder, I know it says today's the 16th. So the reason you need to respond uh, about coming to the Durham Bulls game is that you have to get a ticket. So uh, to get in, it's not just you say you come and you're on a list somewhere. So please contact Maria Perron. All, all families of all residents, staff, faculty, literally anybody can come. It's a really good time. There's free food. I think you've got to pay for the alcohol, though I'm not sure of that. But uh, it, it was really great last year and the year before, and I'm sure will be this year, too. They're playing the Nashville sounds, but nobody really cares. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll drug this up. I don't know if any of you were here about a month ago at Grand Rounds with the giant spider that was found at the end of Grand Rounds. But Will found that the biggest spider in North Carolina is the Carolina wolf spider. They grow up to 1.5 inches. Uh, they're harmless unless you have a heart attack seeing them like uh, I almost did that day. Never figured out what happened to that spider. We covered it with a cup and left. <laughs> And the next week, luckily, the cup wasn't there, but I don't know what happened to the spider. I imagine they can live a long time without eating. Okay, today's all-star is Dr. Andrea Linares Lopez. This was submitted by Rich O'Brien and David Fear. So in clinic, Dr. Linares Lopez took 25 minutes out of her own clinic schedule to explain the basics of migraine care and epic competency to one of our new residents on his first day. This all-star worthy moment was necessitated in large part due to the inadequacy of the day's clinic attending physician, which happened to be me. But uh, thank you, Andrea, for saving the day. Lindsay Anthony, and she's a multi-time all-star. I think this should be like the NFL where you get like five stars and you kind of fill them out over your career. Uh, she's been amazing around the lecanemab uh, uh, introduction, which is absolutely true. She's just been tireless in answering questions for her patients about their insurance, side effects, and the like, and has done a really great job. And Andy nominated Lindsay. So 91 years ago, Duke graduated their first medical school class of 18, including one woman, E.W. Robbins, who you see there in the fourth row in the middle. Uh, looks like they needed two more people in that class. Maybe two had dropped out to make a really good picture. They all look like they're on death row, don't they, in those pictures? Uh, tuition at that time was roughly $300. So, you know, a lot of people could go into neurology because they didn't have huge amounts of debt. Uh, Mike Lutz and last week's speaker, Ave Mogakar, used uh, a new proteomics platform to look at 3,000 proteins in the spinal fluid of patients with mild cognitive impairment and identified multiple incidences of neuroinflammatory and biomarker proteins in these patients. It was in the <laughs> journal Biomolecules. Simon Davis. I mean, he doesn't look like he's on death row. He looks like he's having an art exhibit. Uh, was part of a team that examined how functional interactions between large-scale brain networks help maintain cognitive function in the aging brain, right? When you get old, your brain is actually more active when it does things because it needs more activity to get a thought together. And what I love about doing translational research from our own Lori Sanders her motivation stems from the relationships. If, as most of you might know, Lori does both uh, lab-based research and clinical research. Uh, it's a unique niche for a PhD scientist, and it fueled the fire in her belly to make a difference for folks with Parkinson's disease. I think we all can identify with that. A little retirement update for those of you who don't know, and I thank Tim Collins for this little tidbit. Starting next January, the IRS has decided our catch-up contributions, for which you folk, young folks don't know anything about, but if you're 50 and older, you get to contribute an extra 7,500 a year to your retirement. 
Starting next year, these must be contributed to a Roth IRA, not your typical tax deferred IRA. So that's the, the downside. The upside is people age 60 to 63, and I don't know how they pick that number, can contribute up to 10,000 rather than the 7,500. So I'm sure Duke will be all over that, but just something that you can look intelligent about in conversations about how our retirement plans are changing. Again, that's today's CME. And today's case presentation is Dr. Tasmeen Mushanin. Tasmeen, take it away. Let me stop my share. All right. There you go. We see it. Okay. Just, just make it like full. There it goes. Looks good. All right. That's good. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Tasneem. I'm one of the PGY3 residents. Um, and so this is my case titled When Nature Brings Us to Our Knees. So the chief complaint is it's a 60 year old woman with acute onset weakness. And just to put into perspective, she has no pertinent past medical history, takes no pertinent medications. Um, this was a patient seen in actually Dr. Mayberry's um, clinic. Um, to also put it into context, this was a patient who um, was admitted to an outside hospital and then we saw her in clinic um, later on. So the story is on August 6th to August 11th of 2022, she was on a cruise in the Bahamas. She returned home and on the 13th, she went about her daily activity. She walked three miles that night. And then the next day she woke up with lower extremity weakness, left worse than right with no pain or sensory changes, and her review of systems was completely negative. Um, then on the 15th, she of course went to um, the hospital because of the weakness, um, was found to be COVID positive, and then developed fevers and chills. This was her exam from what I could um, obtain from the records from the outside hospital. Um, these are the pertinent exam findings. Um, her strength in her right upper, left upper, and right lower were five out of five. And her left lower, she was zero out of five in hip flexion, hip extension, knee flexion, knee extension, but five out of five in dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Her reflexes were zero in the left patellar, but two plus in the right patellar. They didn't document what the other reflexes were. And her sensation they documented was normal to touch and pinprick. So at that stage, she had um, labs, of course, um, her CBC, CMP, and CK, the initial CK, were all unremarkable. Um, they did quite an extensive workup with Lyme, ANA, rheumatological um, labs, and those were all negative. And her, the only notable thing was a CRP of 1.7. And then they did imaging. They imaged her entire um, CNS so she had brain, C-spine, T-spine, and an L-spine. And from their reports, it was negative. Um, and then when she came to us, we had our Duke neural, neuroradiologist read the um, MRIs. And our reads was possible abnormal signal in the lower thoracic, spinal cord, and conus. So our exam in clinic, this was in October. This would have been two months after the onset. Um, in her right upper extremity, she was strong throughout except in wrist flexion, she was four out of five. And in her APB, she was four minus out of five. In her left upper, it was similar. She was strong throughout other than four plus out of five in her wrist flexion, four minus out of five in the APB. And then unfortunately in her um, lower extremities, in the left, she was two out of five in hip flexion, hip abduction, and knee flexion, one out of five in knee extension, two out of five in dorsiflexion, and three out of five in plantar flexion. And in the right lower, um, whereas before it was documented that she was five out of five, it seems like she was having a mild weakness in the hip flexion, knee flexion, hip abduction, and dorsiflexion. Our reflexes were interesting. She was two plus in the uppers bilaterally, but zero in the bilateral patellar and Achilles with no pathological reflexes. Um, and her sensation was normal to pinprick vibration and proprioception. 
throughout. And so at that point, she had um, nerve conductions and EMGs done. Um, she had two of them done. And the most notable things were the decreased motor amplitudes um, with slowing of conduction velocities, but no conduction block. She had fibrillations um, in distal, proximal, and lumbar paraspinal muscles. Um, and so in both instances of her EMGs, it was consistent with a motor, an acute motor axonopathy. And so a brief differential would be this list here. And um, actually she ended up having West Nile virus. And so I want to bring home the point that to, for all of us to remember that West Nile virus can cause acute onset flaccid weakness without signs of meningitis and encephalitis. Because typically when we think of West Nile neuroinvasive disease, we think of having the meningitis and encephalitis picture. And then even more so, I wanna bring home the point that it can cause acute onset asymmetric flaccid weakness without signs of meningitis and encephalitis, just as we saw here with her asymmetric um, weakness. So to talk a little bit about this weakness, you know, where does it actually come from? What happens? So with a brief review um, of the literature, it sounds like um, it causes a poliomyelitis looking picture in the majority of cases um, affecting the anterior horn cells. And then in a smaller subset of people, it's been shown to cause a transverse myelitis and even further smaller, a peripheral nerve GBS picture or directly affecting the muscles. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I had a little red herring, the actual fish there on the slide with the um, timeline because you know that abnormal signal that they read, could it have been a little bit of a transverse myelitis? Um, maybe so, but I think that EMG showing the acute motor predominant um, axonopathy is more suggestive of maybe a poliomyelitis um, looking picture. And so to take a step back, I always say to be a good neurologist, we should first be good general medicine doctors. So I wanna make it clear that, you know, West Nile virus infection, only one in 150 have the CNS involvement. So that's a 0.6%. Um, the majority of people who get West Nile are asymptomatic, 80% of people, and then 20% have a febrile illness with myalgias um, and fever. Um, very briefly, this is what the West Nile virus looks like. This is the vector, the mosquito. Um, it's from the Flavi virus family, which is actually the same as hepatitis C and dengue fever. It's positive sense RNA. Birds are red, the reservoirs, and mosquitoes are the vector. And then globally, this is where West Nile virus is found. And the last point I wanna bring home is, I thought this was really interesting. The CDC collects every year the incidence of West Nile, specifically the neuroinvasive disease data. And so here, this is um, the incidence per 100,000 per year. And I just wanna draw attention to, this data is collected from 1999 to 2022. And as you can see, basically, almost every state has had an incidence of it. And definitely North Carolina has had incidents of West Nile neuroinvasive disease. So I just want to bring this up to say, you know, don't completely rule out testing for West Nile virus just because we're in North Carolina, because clearly um, we have had cases of it in the past 23 years. And that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tasmania. That's a great case. And their CSF will have some cells in it, even if they don't have signs of a meningitis. Is that how you think of it? So I, I looked it up. Um, there weren't enough. I, there weren't really any studies that um, had patients who did not have meningitis, did have weakness, and they did test the CSF. But I presume that it would, you know, you would because it's a neuroinvasive disease, you would still see the CSF findings of the pleocytosis with lymphocyte predominance, mildly elevated protein, normal glucose. Okay. Great, great job. All right. So we're really happy to have uh, Jordan Mayberry uh, do today's grand rounds. Jordan, I mean, when I first met him, he was just starting his residency 
but he's now an assistant professor of neurology. And I think all the faculty would agree that watching young people go from uh, residents to you know, admired faculty members is the best thing about what we do. Uh, he did his residency and fellowship here, and he went to the University of Oklahoma College of, Mer Me of Maryland. Sorry, I'm sure that was supposed to be medicine, but it said Maryland, and I thought, maybe that's like Miami of Ohio, Jordan. <laughs> Jordan is uh, very involved in teaching both of the residents. I mean, he's one of the highest uh, rated uh, faculty members here, and he's involved in teaching uh, of the first and second year uh, medical students. We're very excited about his future. And his talk today is gonna be on a treatable genetic disorder, hereditary transthyretin amyloidosis. So Jordan, I'll let you take over. Thank you, Rich. Just get a quick uh, yes or no, if we can see my screen there. Yep, looks good. Great. Um, so uh, great presentation, Tasneem. That uh, was was an interesting case, especially uh, seeing West Nile in the fall. Uh, not exactly what you're you're expecting, but um, <clears throat> so I'm excited uh, about giving this talk today. Uh, specifically, the fact that this is a treatable genetic disorder, um, as Rich said, the uh, hereditary transthyretin amyloidosis. Um, <clears throat> so we can just jump in here. So objectives today, um, just going with a little bit of a background over some common genetic subtypes, the cl common clinical presentations and how to diagnose this disorder, and then treatment. So um, uh, talking about the current treatment that we have available, as well as some uh, exciting upcoming treatments as well. I do not have any disclosures. And so um, you may ask, why why are we even talking about hereditary amyloidosis? Well, our patients have it and they might not know about it. There's a lot of different clues that can really help to identify these potential uh, patient populations. Uh, we have some great testing available to us nowadays and even some uh, genetic testing that is available that's free. Um, so <clears throat> that's good. The median survival at age of onset here is we're talking like years. So this is something that is affecting people, affecting them quite quickly. Um, and the major thing is that we now have treatments to be able to help them. So um, just a little bit of background as far as um, how amyloid uh, really formed here. So your first uh, transthyretin is synthesized in the liver, uh, forming tetramers. So this is in hepatocytes. Um, so they form these tetramers. Once that happens, if they have the uh, point mutations, then those can be mutated and dissolve, creating, creating monomers. And then those can get misfolded. Uh, then they start to clump together as oligomers, and then these fibulars will actually um, start to develop and cause deposits. Now, what the issue is, is whenever these deposits go into the multiple organs in our, in our body and can cause cytotoxicity. Um, so this is a multi-systems, multi-organ uh, disease. So uh, not to um, scare anybody going back to uh, some of our medical school days as far as like with pathology, but um, always found this interesting. So the uh, right hand pictures are basically um, some staining from vessel walls for amyloid. So the top would be more of like the Congo red stain. So there's these amorphous deposits that surround the endoneural microvessels. And then the bottom one is whenever you're um, hitting that with polarized light and showing that classic apple green um, bifurangents. So another thing from uh, potentially medical school and residency, uh, seeing over here on the right-hand side, uh, the, the parasympathetic and sympathetic uh, nervous system. So we're not gonna be going through all of that or ask you to memorize, but keeping it in mind at least. So uh, with HTTR, this is caused by a transthyretin gene point mutation. 
uh, how they come up with TTR there. So I've underlined, so these are transporters of the thyroxine and retinol, uh, which a lot of us know as like vitamin A. This is an autosomal dominant. There is some uh, instances as far as penetrance and a high penetrance versus low with it, but it is autosomal dominant. And this is an amino acid uh, protein formed. Like I said, it's forming the tetramers primarily in the liver, but I do want you to remember that there are other sites as well that can um, form this. So the choroid plexus, the retinal uh, epithelium, and the pancreas. So really, as far as like mutations leading to the detrimental involvement of both our peripheral and autonomic nervous system. So this is more for neurology, although it affects a lot of the other organ systems um, and hence why that cartoon on the right hand side here. So moving right along. So there are some common uh, genetic subtypes that I want you to know about. So this is the precursor for amyloid. Um, they correspond to amyloid disease associated with each of the affected molecules and nomenclature of each subunit protein that has been described. So what this talk is not about is other types of amyloid. So we're not gonna be talking about light chain, heavy chains, or secondary amyloidosis. We're really talking more about the TTR mutations, and there's greater than 120 pathogenic mutations reported worldwide, so uh, quite a few of these. The ones um, that we're going to talk a little bit today about is more of the familial amyloid polyneuropathy ones. So we have the hereditary transthretin amyloid, where you get the HATTR. There's also apolipoprotein A1 related as well as uh, gelisolin related um, neuropathy, but we're really focusing in on the HTTR um, ones. So within that, uh, there are a lot of different types of variants. Val30Med is gonna be our most common one globally. Uh, there's a frequency of about one uh, in 500 in Portugal as compared to here in the United States is about one in 100,000. Interestingly enough, uh, there's also uh, different age of onsets for this. So you can have an early onset form, uh, which actually has a high penetrance rate, as well as the age is gonna be before uh, 50 for onset uh, and quite endemic to Portugal and Japan. There's also a late onset form, which is gonna be in our patients that are greater than 60, a little bit lower penetrance, which uh, oftentimes whenever you're talking with these patients, there's not a family history of amyloid um, and can be in a lot of non-endemic areas as well as Sweden. Now, the most common one that we see here in the United States is VAL 122. Um, this one is predominantly involving uh, cardiomyopathies, um, but can also have some neuro, uh, neurologic complications as well. And I've always found this stat uh, interesting that 3% of African Americans in the United States are carriers for this gene. Now, uh, T60A is probably our most uh, our second most common mutation in the United States. Uh, in some of our patients, it's going to be predominantly of Irish descent. And they can have this mixed presentation of neuropathy, uh, cardiac issues, and autonomic issues. There's a few others here, um, just for the sake of this talk, where um, there's more often associated with carpal tunnel syndrome. Um, so you can see how knowing what kind of variant it is may also help you with um, the, the disorder that it's talking about. Now, um, there's an interesting uh, global multicenter uh, longitudinal observational survey called THAUS, uh, which basically is um, patients with HTTR. And um, the aims of that study was just basically surveying, uh, kind of following the natural history of these patients. Uh, it's very large. I believe it was started back in 2007. 
And so the map over here on the left-hand side uh, is talking um, more about the United States kind of and the rest of the world. So in the United States, what we see as far as incidents, it's a little bit older patient population. So on average, that's going to be about 70 years old or so, a little bit more predominance for males, so about 85%, uh, as well as African-Americans. The most common type is actually going to be a wild type. Um, compared to everywhere else. And then, as I said in the previous slide, the VAL-122 is going to be our, your most common mutation. Uh, and uh, quite often, it's going to be having some type of cardiac phenotype. Now, um, on the uh, for the rest of the world, it's really presenting at like a younger age, so maybe in their 40s, have an equal predominance as far as male to female. Uh, a lot of times these patients are asymptomatic, so not really knowing that they have it or their family does. And then as discussed before, the most common type is gonna be the VAL30 met, um, especially there in the Portugal, Sweden, and Japan. The right-hand um, pie, pie charts just kind of show that broken down a little bit more where uh, you can see the top showing the United States and that wild type actually accounts for about 50% of patients um, and about 22 is almost a quarter, uh, whereas for the rest of the world, about 30 is close to three-fourths and in the United States, we're talking about like 3% or so. Um, so I'm just breaking it down in a little bit different way there. All right, so um, here is the interesting correlation between uh, the genotype and the phenotype. So on the left-hand side, on that y-axis, sh we're showing this cumulative incident, in, and then on the x-axis, showing like the age and onset. And so uh, what I find interesting, if you come over here to age and onset, let's say about 50, um, that whenever you come up, about 10% are going to have some type of cardiac um, issues as far as that goes. Now, if the age onset is 50, you come all the way up here to the neurologic and mixed, you're starting to get to 50% and 70% uh, at, at onset there, which is quite high numbers. Whereas if you're talking about senile or wild type, by 75 years of age of onset, you're already starting to get up to like 70% of the incidence here um, being more of that wild type. And as far as the um, cardiac involvement is quite high as well. Over here on the right-hand side, you can kind of see this uh, spectrum of the genotype and phenotypes and kind of how that correlates. And so um, referring back to the previous slide, we talked about VAL30 met, how this can be an early onset as well as a late onset. So, you know, why is that important? Why um, whenever we're talking with our patients and looking at their age, might that help us out? Well, for the early onset, we're seeing that the phenotype is a lot more uh, neurologic issues um, compared to maybe the late onset is gonna have a little bit of a mixture, but leans a little bit more towards cardiac involvement and then comes all the way over to where, where our valve 122 is actually showing more of like a cardiac involvement and not as much uh, neurology involvement. And as I said before, a big reason why uh, we need to identify these patients is, um, you know, they, they succumb to this disorder. So uh, the median survival for more neurologic symptoms is about five to 15 years. Uh, but once you talk about the predominant issue being like cardiomyopathy uh, with symptoms, you're talking maybe on the order of two to five years without treatment. So um, clinical presentation. Um, so some red flags that can come up, right? I, I've talked a little bit about that this can be a multi-organ uh, issue here. And so it can affect uh, quite a bit of different things within our body. So including the heart, kidneys, GI, um, hepatic system, our um, optho, and then obviously the peripheral nervous system. And it is important to know the um, type of precursor protein, uh, where the tissue is distributed, and really the amount of amyloid de uh, deposition can largely determine what kind of clinical manifestations will happen. I think kind of a take home point here is that if you have a patient that is experiencing a combination of these multi-system uh, symptoms, uh, amyloid should be on your differential, if not towards the top. 
So kind of diving into uh, what a lot of you might be looking at, for instance, in your clinic. So uh, I'm neuromuscular trained. I, I uh, enjoy the neuropathies. And so uh, neuropathies in this patient population are typically going to be more of this axonal sensory motor polyneuropathy. Uh, sensory symptoms are usually the, the onset. They're going to be symmetric, uh, most likely starting in lower extremities and kind of progressing to upper extremities within about four to five years. Uh, there's also progression to motor involvement. So uh, a lot of our idiopathic Peripheral neuropathies uh, oftentimes uh, obviously are not going to be as rapidly progressive as this and, and may never even involve motor issues, whereas these patients are going to have motor involvement uh, somewhat early, uh, as well as having some type of difficulty with gait within the first couple of years of onset. Another interesting thing that happens with these patients is um, having bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, so carpal tunnel syndrome in and of itself is quite common, uh, especially on your dominant hand. Um, but whenever it is severe and bilateral, um, that should be something that maybe piques your interest that this could be um, potentially related to amyloid. The autonomic uh, um, neuropathy symptoms. So uh, this is interesting. This is what I encourage everybody to kind of go through some of these autonomic questions. So I'm asking my patients whenever they're getting up, uh, you know, do they feel lightheaded? Have they ever passed out? Uh, referring to the orthostatic hypotension there. Um, recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, this is something that I now have made a part of my practice to ask a lot of my patients, especially uh, men, uh, in the thought process behind that is due to the potential urinary retention. Uh, sexual dysfunction, it might be uncomfortable to talk about, but very important to talk about, and then sweating abnormalities. Now, something that I don't see as much in this patient population is CNS manifestation. There is a specific uh, subtype, the familial leptomeningeal amyloidosis that can, um, but some other things to look out for would be uh, progressive dementia, headaches, ataxia, seizures, um, and any kind of stroke-like episodes. And then <clears throat> finally here on the page, talking about lumbar spinal stenosis. So uh, the, the thought behind that is that these um, accumulations and beta, uh, beta sheets actually accumulate within the ligamentum flavum and cause a narrowing of the spinal canal, uh, causing said stenosis. So cardiac, um, so I don't expect anybody to necessarily come away with uh, being a, a cardiologist here. So this is this takes a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, but if you are reading through cardiology's notes or uh, you're doing something on your exam and seeing some of this pop up, hopefully it'll uh, pique your interest here towards this disorder. So uh, this is going to be the most common non-neurologic manifestation of TTR. It is really talking more about conduction blocks, cardiomyopathy, arrhythmia, some regurgitation. And what should be uh, looking out for is this kind of restrictive heart disease or hypertrophy that's out of proportion to, you know, hypertension, right? So maybe you have a um, 50, 55 year old person that's coming in, they have a uh, really bad cardiomyopathy, but have not had uh, so much of issues as far as like hypertension. Uh, also, another thing to think about is maybe uh, the patient population is a little bit more intolerant to uh, the cardiovascular medications that are used. And another take home point here. So some type of like heart failure that's progressing quite rapidly um, compared to the overall like cardiac conditions, right? So if somebody is not having a lot of ischemic issues in there, but they're having heart failure, um, this might be something to consider. Other potential manifestations here. So the kidneys, uh, they can definitely be affected here. You can have nephrotic range proteinuria leading to swelling. Um, and actually that can develop within about three to five years of the neurologic symptoms. Um, so perhaps you have a patient that has uh, this progressive neuropathy that's happening. Um, and then within a year to a couple of years, they actually have kidney uh, disease too, and they're not diabetic. So that might raise a red flag there. As far as for your GI symptoms, so 
Um, this, this I've made this a point to start asking more about my patients' uh, bowel and bladder issues, which I never thought as a neurologist I would have to talk about so much bowel movements, uh, but that's that's what the, we live in here. So <clears throat> important to ask about those things, as well as uh, perhaps maybe they are, when they eat, they get full really fast. Um, they oftentimes can have a lot of nausea and vomiting issues. Uh, and not only I'm um, talking about uh, the GI issues, but can also have hepatomegaly too, so an enlarged liver. Ocular manifestations, it's another one that's a little bit more uh, rare anyways in my clinic, uh, but here are a few things that you could potentially look out for just given this multi-system disorder. And then finally, some miscellaneous manifestations. So uh, I know a lot of us probably have patients that come in with fatigue in our clinic uh, that's really unexplained. Um, so this might be something to think about, especially if they don't have like a thyroid disorder, something along those lines. And then weight loss, uh, really asking them about any type of unintentional weight loss. Uh, no, Rich, they're not on Ozempic or anything like that either. <laughs> So um, I know that as uh, providers, we want to, the best uh, for our patients and, and things. And so maybe this uh, will give you a little bit guidance on how to uh, go through a workup of somebody with potential amyloid here. So from the neurologic perspective, uh, it can be challenging. It really can. And so uh, testing uh, considered when the clinical presentation really includes this Progressive neuropathy, it is oftentimes painful, it's length dependent, uh, <clears throat> it can be rapid, and that ambulatory loss is kind of more early on compared to, like I said before, the, like more of an idiopathic neuropathy. Uh, the bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome, so a lot of patients that are coming through uh, getting nerve conduction studies were adding this on to their already, their nerve screen, uh, both sides to be able to test for that. Uh, autonomic dysfunction as well. So as I described, trying to be able to really hammer that down in your history. Unexplained cardiac issues uh, with some like peripheral edema may uh, lead you down this diagnosis. Positive family history, obviously. Um, but the issue there is that about a third of your patients might not have uh, a family history of this. So testing, uh, there are a lot of tests that we can do uh, that are available to us nowadays. So that includes um, sending them down here to the EMG lab, uh, tissue biopsies, serum samples, and the cardiac imaging. So uh, if you do send them down here to our lab, uh, what is probably gonna come back is an axonal link dependent sensory motor polyneuropathy. And this is because of the loss of the unmyelinated and small myelinated nerve fibers. We have had patients because this can be so severe, especially from the axonal loss that have these secondary features of demyelination, for instance, velocity slowing, prolonged latencies, and patients have been diagnosed with CIDP uh, whenever they have amyloid. So uh, perhaps if you have a patient that's diagnosed with CIDP uh, that's receiving the appropriate treatment for that, but not having improvement, uh, coming back to that diagnosis and seeing if that is truly it or potentially could uh, be due to hereditary amyloid. As we talked about before, the bilateral uh, uh, carpal tunnel and then nerve ultrasound. So this is very interesting. It was actually proposed uh, for potential for diagnosis and to guide biopsies for site selection. The evidence for that was a little bit inconclusive. Uh, so we're really using ultrasound nowadays in a supportive role, but not diagnostic. There was a study with about 33 uh, participants that showed that nerve size was quite markably enlarged in our TTR patient population, uh, and but most prominent at sites of nerve compression and proximal nerve segments. Um, so bringing back around to that uh, background in pathology, right? So biopsies. <clears throat> So this is the definitive method for a diagnosis, so uh, tissue biopsy. 
the likelihood of attaining a positive test increases with systemic clinical findings, right? So if uh, somebody has heart, kidney um, involvement, nerve involvement, the autonomic nervous system, uh, then a biopsy is, is hopefully going to be uh, quite fruitful for you. But if it's only the, the nerve uh, or the peripheral nervous system itself, uh, sometimes it's a little bit harder. We already talked a little bit about the Congo red staining, um, so I won't talk too much more on that. So nerve biopsy. So really before uh, pursuing a nerve biopsy, it's important to consider potential complications that might come from that. And most of the time, if you are doing a nerve biopsy, it's going to be the sural nerve. Um, <clears throat> so taking out the, the, this can be like a poor wound healing site, obviously peripherally. Uh, some of these patients are quite a bit older, have other comorbid conditions. Uh, with it being a sural nerve, that's our sensory nerve. So sensation loss distal to where that is at. And painful neuromas can can uh, form where the biopsy was taken. Uh, so, you know, just getting a nerve biopsy is not without potential complications here. Now, there are other uh, non-neurologic tissue sites that you can go for. Um, so actually, abdominal fat pad biopsy is something that I send for some of my patients here. I don't know if everybody's aware of it, but we do have uh, the availability basically Monday through Friday uh, to send your patients directly over from clinic to the fifth floor of the cancer center. They have a procedural lab set up there and they can actually do the fat pad biopsy that day. Um, so it's a very nice service to have. And you have, I had one a couple of weeks ago and had the results back within about 48 hours. So it's pretty quick too. Uh, other things, if there's some GI involvement, you have uh, uh, the GI doctors involved. Perhaps they do like a biopsy of the stomach whenever they do like an EGD. And then um, cardiology. So um, maybe getting some type of tissue from the, the, cardi or the heart itself. And the biggest thing here that I want you all to take away with is if you, let's say you go for that fat pad biopsy, but it was a negative result. That does not exclude this diagnosis at all. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, however you want, you want to look at it, amyloid deposits can be quite patchy. Um, so just because you have a negative biopsy does not mean that they don't have amyloid. So um, remember, we talked about the uh, genotype and phenotype correlations here. So we can send off now um, serum TTR testing. Um, that would be through mass spectrometry, spectrometry uh, which is the gold standard for confirmation of the precursor protein. Uh, there are quite a few different labs available nowadays that we can send these results off or send these labs off uh, even actually for free. Um, so not at a cost to our patients. Genetic testing for these mutations, you want to obtain the sequent analysis and identify the known pathogenic mutation and novel variants. Uh, the gen uh, genetic evaluation really should always be pursued. So if you did the biopsy, showed that uh, there is amyloid, um, genetics should be pursued because um, that helps definitively diagnose these patients and it also can uh, help assist you with prognostication based on this, uh, what we know about the genotype and phenotype spectrum of the disease, right? So if you were to get it back that it's about 30 met early onset, somebody in their 50s, um, you're probably going to be expecting more of the neurologic issues popping up compared to cardiac. And of note, as I said before, there is variable penetrance with these uh, point mutations. So moving right along, uh, so treatment, uh, that's what I am so excited about. Uh, and as you can see here, there are multiple areas that we could potentially and have uh, tried to target to be able to help these patients out. Prior to uh, the treatments that I'm going to talk about, we had um, liver transplant. So it really was the only available disease modifying therapy that we had. Um, <clears throat> it does stop progression of the autonomic and peripheral neuropathy, um, but not really so much of the ocular and leptomeningeal amyloidosis. As you remember, uh, this can actually be uh, synthesized in different tissues outside of the liver. Um, so that is um, something to consider. There's also um, wild type TTR, which can be deposited in the cardiac tissue even after a liver transplant. So it's not perfect. Um, speaking of not perfect, 
Um, <clears throat> there are quite a bit of significant risks as well with liver transplant. So obviously this is gonna be some type of very invasive uh, surgical intervention for it. Uh, these patients are going to have to be on long-term immunosuppression. And if you've ever been on our consult service, uh, transplants and immunosuppressions are not too infrequently our consulted patient population having some type of issue going on and uh, expense. All right, so moving along. So we now have um, a couple oral therapies here. So it's an alternative uh, mechanism for treatment is to stabilize the negative TTR tetramer so that they are not able to form, right? And so there's two medications that slow the rate of progression in clinical trials for, uh, for TTR. So deflunazole and tefamidus. So these are uh, TTR stabilizers. So uh, for diflunazole, um, there was like a two-year phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study where individuals treated with it and had less deterioration of their neuropathy impairment scores uh, than those treated with the placebo at about two years. And then the open-label extension actually showed sustained benefit with a mean treatment time of approximately 38 months. Now, this is uh, indicated for predominantly neuropathic issues with TTR. It is oral, um, so you're taking it twice daily. There are some side effects that we really have to monitor with labs, so that includes renal dysfunction and thrombocytopenia. Uh, and then, as you see there, mechanism of action really being NSAID stabilizing the TTR binding to the thyroxine sites. Um, and then some more comments just talking about contraindications and patients with renal or heart failure uh, and not recommended for severe uh, TTR cardiomyopathy. Our second oral uh, medication is tefamidus. And so uh, this was actually a randomized double blind placebo control trial that um, the um, effects of participants had significant response. About 12 month open label extension demonstrated about 30 months of treatment preserved about 56 ish percent of the neurologic function. And then the main thing that uh, I see this being used for nowadays, especially with our cardiology colleagues, is um, the help with the cardiomyopathy associated with TTR. Um, so there was a double blind study there that demonstrated a reduction in all cause mortality and cardiovascular related hospitalizations as well. Um, <clears throat> this is, like I said, another oral medication. Uh, not really much to report in the way of side effects. It is a small molecule TTR stabilizer, um, benefits greater and less severe cardiomyopathies. Um, and another thing, you're not having to do routine uh, lab work on these people. So getting into some more interesting treatments that I have found. So uh, gene modulation. So these are more novel treatments approach to the treatment of uh, TTR. And so here are two, enoterceron and pantoceron. Uh, both show promise for reducing TTR pr uh, protein production. Um, so basically we're trying to get here at the liver where they're um, uh, producing the TTR tetramers prior to being able to form those um, misfolded monomers. So it's basically TTR silencer. Um, <clears throat> for sake of time, just trying to uh, jump in here. So entoceron uh, is indicated more for this polyneuropathy. Uh, it is a subcutaneous injection weekly. Uh, there are some side effects that you need to know about though, as far as stroke, immune reaction, thrombocytopenia, and glomerular nephritis. Uh, there's actually a black box warning for this drug for thrombocytopenia. Uh, you actually have to enroll in a risk evaluation mitigation strategy program before you can prescribe this medication. So um, obviously not without risk. And this is uh, more as far as mechanism of action and anti cis uh, oligonucleotide. So it actually binds to three prime end of human TTR RNA, causing this downstream processing of the degradation of TTR mRNA to reduce how much TTR uh, levels are circulating. Now uh, for pantoceron, 
Uh, so it is another uh, infusion or it is our infusion medication uh, that is for FDA approved for polyneuropathy and TTR. It's actually about every three weeks. Uh, as far as side effects go with it, uh, you can have some infusion reactions uh, and it is a small interfering RNA. So like within the cell, this cleaves target messenger RNA in a manner that reduces circulating TTR levels. Um, and uh, need to keep in mind that vitamin A supplementation for this as well as interseron is, is recommended. Now for the exciting news, um, uh, some therapies that are now upcoming uh, and some that are approved. So it seems like every time that I give this lecture, I have to update my uh, therapy slides, which I think is a, a great thing to have. Um, so voltaseron is really some, uh, a similar process to pantaseron as far as adverse events uh, and mechanism of action. It's again, uh, more indicated for the treatment of polyneuropathy and TTR. It is instead of um, the monthly subcutaneous inject or the infusions every three weeks, this one is more of a subcutaneous injection every three months. Uh, so obviously patients are probably going to like a little bit more, uh, less frequent in infusions and as well as this doesn't have to be done like in a clinic. Uh, like I said, a mechanism of action is more of an RNA interference therapeutic that reduces TTR production. And down at the bottom there, you can kind of see the open label study uh, with this an external placebo showing that <clears throat> there was um, like it was non-inferior uh, to Pantis here on. Um, now, uh, another upcoming uh, medication that uh, hopefully will be available shortly is eplotinersin. Um, so this is being uh, investigated for the peripheral neuropathy as well as coming up cardiomyopathy. This would be a subcutaneous injection every four weeks. Uh, adverse events um, are, are pretty mild from what uh, we're seeing in studies, uh, possible thrombocytopenia, uh, as far as that goes, but kind of to be determined a little more there. This one is interesting because it is also an antisense oligonucleotide, but it's using this Leica technology, which actually cleaves mRNA at the hepatocyte, preventing protein translation. So it's actually like a conjugated one that lowers TTR production. Uh, what's interesting about this is it's really um, going towards the hepatocyte. So as far as like systemic side effects with some of the other medications that uh, the, the hope is that that is not uh, as much of an issue. And then finally, um, uh, another one that's kind of coming down the pipeline here is this gene knockout therapy. So it's basically the single administration of gene editing therapy. Uh, adverse events are kind of to be determined here, but this is basically CRISPR-Cas9 system, uh, this compromise of this lipid nanoprotein encapsulated messenger RNA um, that's actually been injected. They've uh, done a study, I think there was like six patients with it um, showing that there was not uh, any like adverse events from uh, this therapy. So hopefully more on that in the future. And I couldn't uh, end this talk without talking about how uh, the multidisciplinary approach to these patients, it really does take a village. Uh, we have a, a multidisciplinary team here at Duke that includes cardiology, hematology, nephrology, our GI doctors, and then our orthopedic surgeons. Uh, we meet not too infrequently to discuss um, these patients as well as upcoming treatments and how to um, better serve this patient population. Um, real quick in review, just kind of going through a few things here. Um, so yeah, we talked about the deposits, how we really like to know what kind of variant that we're dealing with. It is multi-system. Uh, you really can try to identify the signs of this through some of the diagnostic tools that I've discussed. Tissue is the issue. Uh, I did borrow that phrase from uh, Dr. Ludke, so I don't know if he has that copyrighted or not, but I uh, always like that phrase. Uh, multidisciplinary approach, as I've said, um, and really the biggest thing is that early detection equal plus early intervention equals slow disease progression. Um, so I think that is going to be references in it. If anybody has any questions, thank you, Jordan. 
And the other interesting thing about Jordan, I left out of his intro, he's about to get married. Jordan, when's the big day? 17 days. All right. So uh, anyone who has a, a, a question on the Zoom, you can uh, throw it in. Uh, Jordan, what about, uh, you know, with the skin biopsy now we get with, uh, for Parkinson's disease, it comes back with an amyloid reading on it uh, and, you know, a nerve fiber density. Uh, how often is something like that positive? I don't know that I have seen <laughs> one. It's I, I see it quite often done, uh, but I don't know that I've had anybody in my clinic actually come back with a positive amyloid on the skin biopsy. Yeah. And the um, the fat pad, we used to poo-poo the fat pad. Uh, is is that making a comeback? So the reason, like I said, I think it's going to be institution dependent, but here, since we're able to get it that like same day and results within um, about 48 hours or so, I still like that. Um, for in instance, I had a gentleman, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, got that, unfortunately, or fortunately, it did not show that he had amyloid. So we had to go towards a more invasive surgery, like a nerve biopsy. But um, I think sometimes if we can save them being cut on and, and under some potential general anesthesia, then that's like worth at least uh, a trial. And in our more systemically involved uh, patient populations, you're going to have a higher probability of having a positive result on it. So you not everybody would do the genetic test, Jordan. Why would you ever do a nerve biopsy? Um, well, it used to be where the genetic test wasn't free. Um, nowadays, we do have um, some uh, labs and, and things that have special grants where it can be free. And so we are leaning a little bit more towards that. I thought I, I assume the drug companies are paying for the genetics. Is that correct? You are correct. Yeah. So, I mean, I, yeah, I would just get that on on everyone. Um, Cindy Dunn wanted to know, what is the incidence of cognitive issues in these folks or any kind of CNS involvement? Yeah. Um, so the if I've seen it at all, it's typically more in the older patient population. So you're talking uh, greater than 70. Um, and, and so the, the question sometimes that come, uh, wh what is it? You know, is it the amyloid? Is this some type of uh, kind of more aging process? And, and sometimes that's a little harder to tease out in this patient population. But if they had a, a, very, a more like rapidly progressive dementia, not really quite lining up with uh, what some of you deal with in terms of like Alzheimer's, that might be something as well as with the multi-system involvement um, that I would look for in these patients. Yeah, as Cindy said, is the skin biopsy helpful? And the answer, Cindy, was no. So I haven't, I haven't yeah, so, had great success with it. So Jordan, let's say you, you know, you take your pop, all your population of people with peripheral neuropathy. And you do your first couple of tests, your serum immunofixation and whatever, and it comes back negative. What percent of those do you think have the uh, amyloid mutation, uh, transthyretin mutation? Oh, that's a, a, a tough one. Um, it's rare. It's This is still okay. a rare disease uh, as far as that goes. So uh, that, that's where I think um, following along with your patient and, and if your normal peripheral neuropathy workup is coming back unremarkable, they're continuing to have progression though. Uh, I mean, Jordan, if the drug company will do the test for free, why wouldn't you just put it into your neuropathy package and stop thinking about it? Uh, I It's hard for me to not think about this stuff, but uh, I think I think, uh, you know, it, since it is becoming more widely available, that might be a, an approach. The truth is, is that we actually get most of our patients from cardiology. Um, so cardiology probably is sending me a couple to four of these patients uh, a week right now um, wow. because they've been identified. And we have a pretty wide catchment area as far as Virginia's, Tennessee, South Carolina that's um, coming to us. Jordan, could you send us or at least email me and I can distribute it, how you'd get that genetic test. Sure. That'd be helpful. All right. Any other questions? All right. All right. Uh, Jordan, thank you uh, very much. Uh, good luck with the wedding.
thank you for all you do for the, the teaching and patient care. And I think it's a great area for you. And uh, everyone else be uh, safe out there till they get this cleaned up, which I don't think will be for a while. Bye.